Last summer, three men and three women volunteered to spend four weeks searching their souls at an Islamic retreat in southern Spain. That's why it's so valuable. So far, the experience has had a profound impact on most of the group. It's such an opportunity and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I feel quite greedy, I just want to grab everything I can from it. I'm learning to see the deeper significance of what's going on and to taste it. I have to taste it. And I think I'm beginning to do that. But it hasn't all been plain sailing. Well, you need to go and read it, Aisha, because that's totally not what I've just read. Go and read it. Well, I had case to listen to you. I just was thinking, oh, God, can't we just accept the differences and stop criticizing each other? Leading the retreat is Abdullah Trevathan, a university lecturer and a respected teacher within the Muslim community. I think coming on the retreat has been a unique opportunity for them all. But this last week is going to be really tough. I think if they want to get the most out of it, they need to lay aside their differences, focus in on what we're doing, and then I think the experience could be life-changing. Set in the quiet isolation of Andalusia, the retreat welcomes visitors of any faith and caters to Muslims of all persuasions. It focuses on the values of what they call classical Islam, the spiritual heart of the religion, with its emphasis on a personal relationship with God. To help his guests get the most from their experience, Abdullah has assembled a team of British Muslims who will mentor and help teach the daily classes of religious instruction. As they enter the final week, the six are about to face their biggest challenge yet, the holy month of Ramadan. It's the most sacred period in the Islamic calendar as it commemorates the handing down of the Quran from Allah to the Prophet Muhammad. It's also the fourth of the five obligations or pillars on which Islam is founded. A time when all Muslims must submit to their dependence on Allah. From dawn to sundown, there is no drinking, there's no eating, there's no uh, sexual intercourse. It's a complete if you like, negation of all the usual uh, bodily needs. This is a time for us, all of us on the retreat, irrespective of any differences of religion or not religion or whatever, this is a time for us really to lay all those things aside and to be uh, as one. It's also a month when we remember the, the, the hunger of the poor you'll find that emotionally you're a little more fragile. You'll find that your heart will be much more open and receptive. So this is a time really of great importance on the retreat. I'm, and a, bit, I'm a bit nervous about it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be with you. We're going to be with you, yeah? You don't argue, you don't do lots it's of more than 20 like years since ad salesman right. Azim yeah, observed yeah, Ramadan. He was raised a Muslim but rebelled against his father's strict adherence to the faith. Since coming to the retreat, Azim has rediscovered his Islamic roots. Sisters used to talk about Ramadan and I used to be sarcastic about it because I didn't, I didn't fast or anything like that. So one day says, are you fasting? I say, no thanks, I've got enough points on my license. I'm kind of uh, looking forward to it, to tell you the truth. Maybe this, this will be the, that was the final part of the challenge where it gets tough. For nearly three weeks, the group has been following a demanding timetable based on the traditional five daily prayers. It includes periods of silent contemplation, religious instruction, and manual labor around the estate. The intense schedule is having an impact on all the participants. One of the things that um brings it even more home in the... 28-year-old psychotherapist Pom Jenkins is finding answers to many of her long-standing questions about the divine. I had so many jokes before I came out, oh God, you're gonna come back with a hijab, and um, I don't think realistically I'm gonna, in four weeks, gonna suddenly become a Muslim, but you know, maybe, maybe I will. These are all patterns, and some of them are, some of them are good, some of them are bad. 
You know, if I want to make a change, it has to be, <gasps> I've got, you know... I've Whilst Pom has responded intuitively, agnostic science graduate Simon Yarrow has been unable to connect on anything but an intellectual level, to his increasing frustration. I'm really fed up and pissed off. I just feel this huge weight of expectation. Everybody keeps saying, oh, there's as many different ways to, to God as there are people. Well, yeah, just leave me alone a bit then. As well as the five universal daily prayers, there is a congregational form of worship known as dhikr, or remembrance of Allah, everyone is expected to attend. But some have rejected this, claiming that communal chanting is bidha, a deviation from Quranic rules. No, but seriously, why don't I just join the choir at my local church? No, 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 Heart, stick to this, mate. Yes, this, this is not. This is going to take you to heaven. <laughs> oh, not again. To Leading the dissenters no. is Aisha Alvi, <laughs> a barrister who specialises in Islamic law. <laughs> I was trying to read my Quran, and there was all this chanting going on. The aspects of worship Aisha objects to derive from the Sufi tradition, a mystical approach to Islam that inspires Abdullah and the other British Muslims on the retreat. Despite trying to be as open-minded as possible, I think I'm finding quite a few of the concepts and the beliefs difficult and uncomfortable because they don't fit with, and I won't say my understanding of Islam, but very much an understanding of Islam that that goes across the rest of the Muslim world. How do you know that you're not just, just destroying the tree? <laughs> you know what, Aisha? Yeah. I might swear at you. <laughs> you're so rude. <laughs> like, me, oh, that's like saying I'm the only one talking. Even Aisha's main ally, Muslim convert Khadija, is becoming frustrated with her outlook. I sometimes feel that I can't have my own freedom of expression because I'm going to get jumped on. I don't think she does it intentionally. I think it's just the fact that she believes in what she believes in and she can't accept that anybody else has another point of view. And it's just like, oh, for goodness sake, like, leave me alone. Leave me alone to do my own thing. For over one billion Muslims around the world, Ramadan begins only when the rising crescent moon is sighted. Though a Muslim, businessman Madassa Ahmed admits he only ever went through the motions of praying. Now, for the first time, he's connecting with the spiritual side of his faith. As a Muslim, you're always well aware of the fact that Ramadan is meant to be the time when you really ought to feel as spiritually nourished as possible. My Ramadans over the past two or three years have not been like that. When you're fasting and you're working, you kind of miss out on the whole sort of essence of the whole thing. And over here, I hope to recapture the essence and through that, feel, feel better, feel more, more connected. Um, and I've got a very good feeling about this Ramadan. I've got a very good feeling about it. I mean, I think this is it's amazing that it's culminated in this. It's just surreal. Of a saga. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, then yeah, the yeah, right yeah. of it. Oh, my God. Look, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. Very nice. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, the body really feels that lack of sugar. A few hours left to the end of the fast and spirits can begin to sink them. So there'll be less laughing and joking. Even during the fast of Ramadan, work must go on. Miss this, you know. I really, I'm gonna miss this. It's gonna be so boring jumping into my car, driving to work with all that crap. Everybody, all that road rage. I mean, look at this. It's a wicked thing. By late morning, the group is starting to get a taste of what's to come. Got up for breakfast and had a very decent breakfast that was focusing on the food and actually forgot about the liquid side, which is a fairly fundamental side. And it's now, you know, in direct sun, doing quite a lot of physical labour and we've got like a fluffy time already. I feel quite... This is fasting for you. You know I've gone too far when I drop down of dehydration. You know, I'm just noticing that the energy is flagging, and I, I understand perfectly that the energy is flagging. The thing is not to set up in opposition to it, but not to settle simply, you know, of just relaxing into exhaustion. And I think when you when you're fasting, you can get very lightheaded. If they lose it here. The danger is they'll lose it on the outside. With energy levels flagging and no revitalizing lunch to break up the day, a sweltering afternoon during Ramadan leaves plenty of time for inward reflection. It's been the first uh, Ramadan, the first fast in over 20 years or 20, 20 some years. <laughs> this kind of environment that we're living in at the moment, in this Islamic retreat, it is. If you want to do it, you can do it. If you don't want to do it, there's no pressure. Don't worry, we'll understand. So, which makes me want to do it. It's a really nice ritual to all gather in the mosque at the evening prayer and it was just really, it was really touching actually. It does give you a real sense of the Muslim community because I know everyone's doing it today and I knew everyone was breaking their fast, you know, in the evening and um, you know, that's, that's quite special, it makes you feel very unified. Each week, Abdullah takes the group out into the wilderness for a period of silent meditation. The exercise is designed to focus attention onto the spiritual, and Abdullah hopes that during Ramadan it will take on added significance. The person who is hungry and tired, their heart is very soft and they're very open. You know how, you know, when you're a bit tired that you tend to stare? Mm. Oh, I like that. That's, that's sort of the kind of thing. The wide attention, which is being where you are. Yeah? The narrow attention is looking down, perhaps, at the ground, at a dung beetle, you know, wrestling with a, a big ball of dung. <laughs> yeah? And how amazing that is. Yeah? It so is. it's going from, from, the, you know, from the cosmos to the microcosm. Yeah. If you don't put into the struggle enough, you're not going to get anything out of it. By cutting away 
extra useless, even destructive baggage that we've created for ourselves. Once we do that, if you like, in a sense, the heart is, as the prophet said, the heart is polished. The heart is polished and it's able to reflect the divine light. How was it? Pom? Um, just, just there was loads of entertainment from all the wildlife. Uh, just completely absorbing stuff going on with the ants. And there was a praying mantis who I'm sure... Um, was having a conversation? We, yeah. We were definitely mm. engaging on some level. And did you it feel that you were controlling time. your attention? You yeah, feel? yeah. For a few points, definitely. Not, not for the whole time. Aisha, what did you... I was just a bit bored, really. I just kind of... Okay, I to pick that's, things. boredom is fine, boredom is a state, yeah? In other, instead of having boredom be done to you, mm. either choose boredom or choose something else. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Well, I chose to throw a few rocks and see what happens and how far they can go and how far I can throw them. Yeah, I don't know but that's an action. But what I'm yeah. saying is choose, you were talking about the inward, yeah? Because there'll be many times in your life where you're going to be sitting around waiting for people. If you can utilize the time to focus on the divine or something like that, it'll be a strength. But I probably do that often, but then there are other times mm. when you just don't feel like even doing that. Fair enough. Okay. Because you've chosen not to do it. Allahu Akbar. Abdullah accepts that Aisha will do her own thing, but he's concerned that a continued skepticism is undermining the experience for other people. Good. Well, that was good work. While Pom is finding that Islam does offer her answers about the God she has always somehow known, Aisha's attitude is becoming a problem. I, I, found, I found it quite upsetting today, actually, because it's just that we don't have that long left, and I don't know, I feel like this kind of continual criticism of the approach of the retreat is, is kind of infecting the experience for me a bit. It, you know, it may well be because of the Ramadan fast as well, just feeling a bit more kind of raw and emotional. I'm gaining a lot personally from the retreat and the way that the retreat is run and the approach we're taking. To me, it's, it's made very Islam very accessible and really appealing. That evening, it emerges that Simon, by far the most sceptical member of the group, did experience something out in the wilderness. Okay, so I guess the cat's out of the bag. I had what I consider to be a spiritual experience. I mean, for some people, you know, that would absolutely definitely be a sign. Why am I not jumping up and down with joy and why am I still sort of left questioning? By the next day, Simon's news has spread. I have heard rumor <laughs> oh, of you having a spiritual experience. <laughs> it could have been that, I don't know. <laughs> don't be pessimistic. Yeah. Because you can kill it. And you, of all people, don't want to kill that. Yeah, you're right. So what happened? Um, I just said to God, um, if you exist, I would really like to to know you, to have a relationship with you. Yeah, and then just this voice came back, and it wasn't wasn't an outside voice. I mean, it wasn't like so there was a clap of thunder, and mm. and just sort of said, "Well, just believe," and you know that was it. But for me, I'm still having a well. Uh, yeah, but all of the words said, "Just believe." And the thing is, now, did you believe? Probably not. I've had all these people saying, "Oh, just let go, dive in." I mentally, physically, emotionally don't understand what they mean by that, mm -hmm. that I'm not doing already. Okay, you have to rest the rational mind. You've just yeah. got to rest that rational mind. And part of the fear, I think, that you're feeling, or part mm. of the nervousness, if you like, is the letting go. Mm. Yeah. 
this is not this this is not meant as any offense or anything. No, 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 that's cool. But you are a very controlled person. Mm -hmm. You're very controlled, and that it means that somehow or other you're going to have to let go of something. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that you will go under, mm -hmm. or be drowned, or be overwhelmed. And nor do you have to think, at this point in time, or at any point in time of any particular religious observances. Mm. Don't worry, uh, we've got questions on our That way. afternoon, Simon yeah. seeks out Aisha, who reacted so negatively to the whole wilderness exercise. He doesn't want her skepticism tainting his experience. Um, I just wanted to talk to you because I had a very spiritual experience and why I wanted to talk to, to you about it particularly Aisha is because you can make it very hard for somebody like me who's got no experience of these things you almost sort of negate what I'm experiencing and I think this sort of whole conforming thing and things like that just it just doesn't help me because I, I'm an individual and by you saying I've got to conform, I automatically want to push that away. It's not embracing. It just seems very full of dogma. I'm sure if you met me in my ordinary everyday life, you wouldn't think what you're thinking. It's just the way we're sitting in lessons, the way we're learning, the approach, you know. And I'm sure if you know you met my friends, they wouldn't they wouldn't think I'm dogmatic. Actually, far from it. I don't want to, I don't want this to sound nasty, but just you know, if I'm if I'm feeling that, then other people are feeling that. And just, just maybe stop yourself a little bit and say, yeah, if if I know that I'm doing that, you know, maybe I shouldn't do it. I'm feeling it's hard work. At the beginning, it was everything was sort of new, and and now I've moved on to a different phase, and that seems to be maybe my sort of line of questioning in the classes, and if that's sort of appropriate or not, or inappropriate really. Um, in that it seems to be interfering with what other people's perception is about Islam through me. I'm almost maybe in some ways making Islam sound dogmatic, which is what Simon felt. So I'm in kind of a sticky situation. Okay. You want to step up on there? Aisha is beginning to grasp the effect her approach to Islam is having on others. But she's not quick to compromise her principles. Who's next? Woo! <laughs> Next patient. <laughs> Looks like we call henna. Yeah. Okay. Today's work involves crushing grapes for their juice. And while the other Muslim women on the retreat don't feel the need to cover their feet, Aisha insists on covering hers with plastic bin bags. No, no. Would it be very Islamic to roll my trousers up in front of all these men and expose We're fasting, myself. we're fasting. So, and this is the Islamic way of doing it while still joining in the activity. And I want to stamp on grapes too. And it's, anyway, it's much more hygienic. Who wants to You're going to have to take the plastic off because it's going to rip. No, I don't mind uh, my, it ripping, but as long as I've covered when I come out. Well, you'll all just have to look away when I come out. Okay, we'll do that. That'll be the, no, that's modesty. Islamic modesty. Back foot up. I'm going to fall in. <laughs> well, that's the point. You'll squish them when you fall in. Okay, off you go. Right, bismillah. Go on, now start running. Gosh. They're gone like this. I wanted to say something to you. Your, your kameez is going to get... Yeah. It's already stained. But can, we, can we lift this up? No, because it's too tight. Right, shall we ask the men to... Yeah, to, to look the other way. To go away? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but there's, no... I, there's a camera, so that's all the same. <laughs> Have you been sent away? Well, okay. Um, this is the exactly where... You can see, if you like, in a way, the flow of life sometimes can get stemmed by over-regulating uh, religious ordinances. But we're trying to accommodate everybody and make everybody happy, and as long as we get the grape juice. Don't know how far you have to be not to be able to watch, because <laughs> everybody around here is still having to watch. 
You ready? But I guess you've got to go over there, behind the haystack. For Aisha, reconciling her Islam with modern daily life is a struggle. It's a constant battle to strive to be a good Muslim, definitely. But it's my personal struggle, and it's the standards that I set for myself. Travelling here alone, is that allowed? Um, listening to music, is it allowed? So those are the sort of questions that I think my life throws up constantly. And, you know, yes, I, I lapse, and I'm not as good a Muslim as I should be more than often. Maybe this perception that's possibly coming across of being somebody who's very holier than thou, I'm definitely far from that, definitely. You know, it's just as much a struggle for me as it is for everybody else. But not everyone regards Aisha's struggle to be a good Muslim as a problem. Over the weeks, Azim has been finding her Islamic rigor increasingly attractive. I'm kind of closer to her than any of them because I'm attracted to her in a certain way and I suppose she's, she's not attracted to me she was, mind you you know, she can't speak her mind because of Islam you know what I mean she, she near enough to a certain degree kind of confides in me with certain things to me I'm not being funny but I don't know, this might be really blasphemous, but love is a lot stronger than religion, to me. You know? So, I just think that she, Islam comes before absolutely any kind of emotion or anything like that. So. Aisha has no idea that Azim is falling for her, and he knows that her strict Islamic code makes sharing his feelings unwise. I should keep away from him that way, to the side of him. Well, where am I tense. supposed to walk in the ditch? <laughs> well, more or less, yeah. Pom is also finding Islam increasingly attractive, though for different reasons. I have been looking for a way to kind of regulate my connection to, to God. And I think this is, this probably is it. One of my perspectives that's changed is I've always, always kind of chased freedom. Timetables and things just made me ugh, feel so trapped. But this is submitting to some kind of structure and framework of timetables um, just affords you a massive amount of freedom. It's the opposite to what I thought it was. And the whole kind of Muslim Islam thing, they're just, they're just words, they're just labels. It's, all it is, is is trusting in a system that millions of other people have committed to and find solace in. You know, where can the harm in that be? This morning, Azim, who's also enjoyed attending prayers, has failed to turn up. He's up in the hills, struggling with the realization that he's probably not the type of man for Aisha. I feel silly. She's probably going to get married to somebody who's, who's um, a lot more religious. And the person that she she may marry, um, I'm fighting the idea that she'd be better off with him. If you know what I mean, I think, you know, he's probably going to be better for her, career-wise or Islamically or... Because you can't just survive on personality, can you, really? What happens, happens. But I've just changed the type of woman I feel is attractive now. I'm not just going to see something that shines and think, that's gold. Sometimes when, when gold is covered with black cloth, that's when the challenge is and, and it's protected as well, isn't it, when it's covered with black cloth.
whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. Not me, you, or anybody in this world can actually change it apart from one person. And that's what I've started to believe. My fixation with something first led me to, to disappointment. God, I'm so silly. What I've done is detach myself from the outcome. And for once in my life, I do. <laughs> Sounds a bit cheesy. But it's in the hands of God. It's in the hands of Allah. Abdullah hopes that when they leave the retreat, the group will apply what it's learnt to life in the outside world. With the end in sight, he wants the group to understand that often it's the way we do things that's important. Every week or so here we slaughter one of the lambs for our food. We use traditional halal methods uh, as stipulated in the Quran. I'm hoping that by allowing the participants to take part in this, uh, and to see the care and respect that we show the animal, that we will demonstrate why it's so important for them always to take responsibility for their actions, not just here, but in their everyday lives outside. The point is, it is a bit risky doing it though, because some people can be, can be quite horrified by it. Is this how you have to catch a sheep to go for I had it. Stop it! Stop it. Oh. is the great reminder. <laughs> Blood. Finality. <sighs> you know, it, 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 does, it does work. And it works strongly. All right, who's, who's going first? Men? Women. Okay. We need to take it apart to a separate place so that it doesn't see other animals being killed or anything like that. There's also the question of death itself. So in a conversation with the animal, you should sort of apologize for taking its life, but also point out that, you know, like, like the animal, you too will die. Um, the retreat's that, regular halal butcher will kill the animals. If you like sustain. Well, maybe we'll see you in heaven. Inshallah. If we get there. So it's amazing to think she's actually transcending into another world. She is about to give luck. Yeah, you look. Oh, watch. Come to the side because they'll squirt out. Bismillah. Bismillah. Good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck, sheep, good luck, sheep. Oh. Okay, let it move because it'll get the blood. Those are the throws. Those are just the nerves. Yeah. When he first arrived at the retreat, Madassa struggled to settle in and engage with his emotions. But over the weeks, he's become a keen student of the spiritual path. Now, keen to set himself an emotional challenge, Madassa is thinking about dispatching the second sheep himself. Uh, I wanted to, to feel what it means for the animal and for me. And I think. Um, Right now, sitting there with the sheep, it, it gave me an incredible sense of responsibility for humans. The fact that we have the choice and we can do this to animals. You got it? Madassa has psyched himself up. I'm trying not to show the knife to the animal. But despite his well-intentioned desire to face up to this deep emotional responsibility, Abdullah insists it should be left to the expert. Okay. It's lost consciousness completely, yeah? Take the front. Okay. 
Here we go. <sighs> to be mentally prepared yeah. to kill something and then not to kill it is a unique feeling. But I'm really kind of traumatized that I couldn't oh. do it. But what are you traumatized about? Where the is the trauma in that? that the sheep suffered? Both, a bit of both. Mm. Since arriving, Madassa has been struggling to overcome his belief that emotions are negative and hold you back. To Abdullah, his response to the slaughter could be significant. Yeah, uh, well, just, I just wanted to talk to you because when it didn't work out, I saw some real, I saw re really saw Mudasa. The veil lifted mm. and I saw some real emotion. Yeah. You want to do more of that. Mm. So there's no, there is no failure here. It's mm. not a question of failure. Yeah? Not being able to have done the act, it's in its own way, it's quite affects you. Mashallah, you know, it's the will of God. Yeah. Just accept it, move on. It doesn't mean that it's finished. I think you have a, a, a deep spiritual capacity. Yeah? I think you should really explore it. Yeah. If you allow yourself to explore that, it's going to affect every other area of your life, particularly with authenticity. Yeah, I've said that a lot to you. Authenticity is the kind of a key thing. It's as if when I go back after Ramadan, it's like a, I'm just going to release the boat from the anchor and let the waves take me wherever they take me. Mm. Um, God will decide what lesson you need to learn at what time and what means what to you and when. And it promises to be an exciting journey. Yeah. It's been so good. <laughs> yeah, so good. The killing of the sheep has a powerful effect on Madassa. Pom's response later that night is slightly more unusual. I fell asleep into a kind of really deep sleep for a few minutes and had this dream. We were having a lesson, like one of the classes that we have here on the retreat. There was this um, flock of sheep next to us. And then I realised that one of the sheep um, was kind of resting on me. And this, I instinctively felt really at home with it and, and was happy that it, it was resting on me. It was a really, really kind of a moving dream. I felt very, very loved and accepted and understood by this sheep. It was literally, I was almost still dreaming when I was getting out of bed. Extraordinary dream of all these sheep. He put his paws each paw. Then it suddenly popped into my head that I saw this clear um, page in a book I read in, in the library here, and I could see this line that was actually highlighted in my head, and it said, um, "The derivative of the word Sufi is from wool." To Pom, the Sufi connection at the heart of her dream is no coincidence. She interprets it as having deeper significance. The way I felt, I knew it was a, a important dream. I feel like I've been battling on my own and trying so hard and kind of swimming against the tide in terms of the way I've been trying to worship. But even you know, even as these words are coming out, they're so they're so fledgling that they're surprising me. Pom has spent four weeks immersing herself in Islam. She has begun to find that the Quran answers many of her lifelong intellectual questions about the nature of the divine. Suddenly, wow. The dream of apparently Sufi sheep has pushed her to the brink of a life-changing decision. I, I don't know, I, I feel quite kind of, um, I, I, this gives me butterflies actually even with saying anything, so I feel, not nerves exactly, but someone said, um, if this is the one that really feels right for you, maybe you should make some kind of um, commitment. And I, I felt really split because on one hand I was thinking, wow, you know, maybe I can. And, that, and that's actually 
you know, I didn't expect it to be really appealing, but it did seem really, it's really exciting actually. Um, but then on the other hand, I was thinking it's ridiculous. I've been here for three and three and a bit weeks, and I was worried about being a hypocrite. You know, almost pretending I'm some scholar and something. I, I no, 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 no. Oh yeah, not at all. Hugely ignorant. And, no. um, you saw somebody become Muslim the other day here. Yes, but then I, I called it him after and I was trying to get all this information out. And uh, and I said, how long have you been thinking about it? He said, 42 years. <laughs> but I think it's because he was 42 years old. So, I think you need to make a decision. Well, I think I have. It's, it's going to mean a profound change. I'm comfortable with that. I'd like, I'd like mm. to do it. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to repeat to you these words. I'm going to repeat. All anyone has to do to become a Muslim is to repeat in good faith the words I declare that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his last and final messenger. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Ashadwan. Ashadwan. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad Rasulullah. That's it. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. How do you feel? I feel, um... I, all I can say is, is right, really. It's just... Yeah. Very, very glad, very... So relieved that it's over. Yeah, relieved it's over and... Mm. Um, really kind of hopeful, I think. Yeah. And, and, and excited. And Good. But not in a kind of daunted way at all. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hmm. Yes, it's dramatic in that I wasn't a Muslim five minutes ago and now I am. But it's not dramatic because I'm not changing who I'm worshipping um, and I'm not changing myself. So. Yeah, it just feels like a kind of natural enhancement. Um, and I feel because over these four weeks I've began to feel more and more and more accepted and familiar with Islam and the way things have been run on this retreat, I just I kind of feel like I'm home rather than I've arrived somewhere new and d strange. After Gussel, a ritual shower, Pom announces her decision. I'm not going too far over because I think she's, she's the epitome of the English Muslim because in the, in the United Kingdom, really, the, there's a need to create a culture, not preserve a culture, not preserve a Moroccan or an Egyptian or a Pakistani or an Indian way, <clears throat> but the need to create a British Islam, which meets the spiritual needs of the British people people in, in modern times. I think she's going to be a light, you know, I think she's going to be a light that people will come to. We've got a new sheep in the fold. Gosh, that's amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? You don't all have to end up like her. Just be, just oh, oh. Um, delete that. Islam means peace. Aisha is profoundly moved by Pom's conversion. As much as we've had ups and downs, you know, we've all shared a lot. And it really is a beautiful religion to be able to share with other people. And, and like you said, you might not understand all the ins and outs, but it's just the basic belief of la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasul, and that's what we believe, that's what Islam is. We make things complicated, but it really is simple. You know? Just from listening to you talk then, mm. you seem to be talking from a kind of point of le less of a struggle. Yeah, because when you just get down to it, you get mm. on with it. That's life. Mm. You know, mm. life's just too short. Mm. It's a big thing to admit that you've realised something that you wouldn't have realised. That shows that you're open, which is good. 
So, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. There are different tendencies in Islam, but they all come under the banner of Islam. And um, I think Aisha's presence on the on the team has been, you know, ultimately a, a very, very good thing. Mm, invaluable. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes problematic for me personally, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I feel I feel gratitude towards her. Long story short, I am now a Muslim. Um, it's really kind of didn't know this was going to happen today when I woke up this morning. I feel really excited that I've actually I found my way. I found the way I, you know, for me. Um, and I feel like I've been looking for so long, and it's such relief to like go, oh. It's here, and, and I'm here, and it kind of feels like I'm home. Ramadan is the month of mercy and forgiveness. So with just two days to go, Iqbal, one of the teachers, focuses on the families that await the group in the outside world. Is the mother. That's why you find that the mother for mother of one Khadija, who has virtually no contact with her own parents, this holds special significance. And the mother, Allah says that paradise is under her feet. Is under her feet. Can I ask a question yes. about parents? My yes. parents don't like me at all because of my religion and because yes. of my etc. etc. So how does that leave me? Because this to... paradise certainly isn't under my mother's feet. It is. If they close the doors to you, mm. my advice to you would be to keep your doors open for them. Allah lives in the hearts. And the mother is the personification of the mercy of Allah. Azim is unusually quiet throughout the lesson. Like Khadija, relations with his parents and particularly his father have always been difficult. You can see who that is, can't you? Hmm? You should be doing that. Bit more. Somehow it doesn't have the same effect kissing a, a photo. Maybe I should put that into practice, huh? Yeah? Time is so important. Maybe I should start respecting him. Maybe I'm not giving him enough joy and happiness. That's maybe I should be given a lot more joy and happiness, you know? So... It used to be worse, years ago. I could feel as if, like, you know, I was, I was dirt in his eyes because I wasn't Islamic. I want to start being more... Believe, I want to believe more. Not just for me, but I want to believe more for my father. If you go back to your parents, are they upset because you've, you've chosen this particular religion or are they upset because you've just become religious? They seem to think that I'm rubbing their noses in it by changing my, by changing my name and changing my whole way of life. Uh, they can't quite get their heads around why I'd want to choose a religion that's not something that's native to my own country. I phoned them on occasions, you know, and they, my mum will speak to me but then and my dad doesn't want to know. I mean, as, as um, Sidi Iqbal was saying, uh, maybe we, both of us, should try and make that step forward, to try and actually... Yeah, I think, I'm, I, think I will. I think I'm just going to have to rise above it and, and you know, get in, t get in touch with her whether she likes it or not. Build that bridge, man. Make, make that bridge, because when they're gone, then you'll think, I wish I'd done it, I wish I'd done it. Mm. Mm. As long as you know in your heart, yeah. at least I try... There are issues that surround stuff that's gone on with me and my parents over the, over the last 10 years which really is totally irrelevant in the grand scheme of things and I feel that um, now's the time I need to break that pattern. It's just been too long. It's just too long. Too long a time to 
just been messing around and trying to make excuses. As much as I've tried to rationalise the reasons why I don't keep in touch, and when it all comes down to la 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 la, there's nothing but la, and we're all accountable to him. And the relationship you have with your parents is is incredibly important in Islam. Simon is meeting his mentor Rahma for the last time. He's still trying to work out whether or not he can just believe. I mean, the important thing probably that I'm going to have to take away from here is this sort of spiritual experience that I had. Um, didn't say to me, you know, become a Muslim or, you know, become a Jew or any, any of these things. It just said, just believe. And I'm, do you? I'm, do you think you do? Um, I'm still, yeah, wavering. Mm. Um, Faith is something that uh, grows. Mm. I hope so, because if it if it's a if it's a bang one moment and I've just missed it, well I've missed it. What are you looking for then? Um, I don't. It's something and a place where I can put things into context. You know, I'm going on to a, a Jewish course after this, and I want to go on to a Buddhist retreat as well. Go on. Um, but you've done lots of investigations into. I've got a horrible feeling I might end up coming back to Islam, actually. Horrible feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a horrible feeling once um, as well. Yeah, well, I knew, I knew you had, which is why I it's mean, really it's interesting. The challenge is to accept God. In the Quran, Allah says, you know, I'm here. And he's asking, where are you? You know, he's saying he's there. I have to. I have to answer him. It's the final day of the retreat. Since making a new commitment to the faith of his father, Azim has been attending the mosque for all five of the daily prayers. La ilaha illallah. Today, he is asked to perform the Adhan, or call to prayer, for the first time in his life. <laughs> Melissa, an expert in Quranic recitation, gives him a last-minute lesson. La in his be lighter than la ilaha illallah. The name of Allah is heavy, but the rest is light. La, la ilaha illallah. That's it. Right. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. I'm actually asking 20, 30, 40 people to come and pray and they're coming to pray. It makes me feel proud and hopefully it'll make my father feel proud if he, if he does get to see it. He wouldn't have thought a month ago that I'd be actually standing up on the top of the minute actually asking for 20 to 30 people to come and pray. I mean, this is just... <laughs> it's not amazing, it's just mind-blowing, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Ashhadu alla ilaha illa Allah Yeah, seriously, my, my hair's went up my... You didn't even know the Adhan. You were asking me a day ago, what's the Adhan? You didn't even know the Adhan. Tell me what, you've got a bloody big gob. I wouldn't like you coming at me at five o'clock in the morning. You're missing the prayer, quick. Yeah. Go on, run, run at the wind. Suddenly, suddenly. Salah, suddenly. Go on, after you. Come on, Kiddie. After four weeks at the retreat, it is time to return to the outside world. People need this, that's all I can say. People need to allow Allah to touch their lives. 
the feeling is amazing. They need to allow that to happen. So, I mean, for me personally, this has been the mother of all retreats, as they say. <laughs> One thing what I've observed, every stream of Islam has been represented. Everybody has their differences, but um, we've tried to understand each other and uh, work together. I came here not knowing really why I was praying, just going through the motions, and, get, and, and, and that's definitely gone now. I feel a lot closer to Allah than I did before I came, um, and I'm 100% sure that, that that will continue. All the loose ends have been tied up, all of the tensions within the group have been resolved. I'm now just kind of almost chomping at the bit as of this evening to just get out there and get on with life. I could apologise to my father all day long, but I can tell you now that I will show you that I can become decent. Not just good, but a decent Muslim. No, I don't want a snug, just a little pickle. Though. Yeah, you got some thinking to do when you get back. Yeah, but yeah? I see you, you were thinking before, anyway. Whatever is happening back in the UK, if there's terrorists or bombs or everything, it's got nothing to do with what you've experienced here. Absolutely nothing to do. Gonna, gonna kind of measure. Yeah. So. yeah. Pace it. Yeah. 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 Don't expect your dad to be like, yeah, wow, fantastic, yeah? I know he's not going to be. Yeah. You just take everything on the chin. Yeah? Aisha, assalamu alaikum. Have a good trip. I have a feeling we're going to see each other again in the UK. Yeah? <laughs> At some young Muslim meeting or MCB meeting or some kind of meeting somewhere. No, 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 no. no. You have to no, come no. to Manchester and see our centre. Thanks for coming, really. And thanks for being here throughout the month and sticking it out. And, you know, and just being Aisha. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. We'll do. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا للصلاة حيا للصلاة حيا للفلا حيا للفلا الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله